Good morning, little masters, and welcome back to today's Tolkien Times. I'm the man of the West, also from the Prancing Pony podcast. Let's get week 18 underway with another Mailbag Monday. Joshua W., a member of the Today's Tolkien Times Patreon, asked in our private Patreon Discord channel, New to the Legendarium, I've read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and just finishing up The Silmarillion. I would like to know if there is anything about what happened to the other rings. I know the nine men became ring wraiths, but what about the dwarf ones? And why was Tolkien so keen on rings of power rather than something else? So, we want to know, first off, why did Tolkien make these powerful artifacts rings specifically? Why not the necklaces of power? And then we want to dive into the fate of the dwarven rings, and maybe why we don't have any short, angry ring wraiths wielding axes and inexplicably speaking in a Scottish accent. Well, the answer to that first question, why rings specifically, might be less exciting than you'd expect. Now, I'd love to find some gem of a quote that says it's about the symbolism inherent in a ring, the infinite circle that symbolizes... Nah. Or how about something that ties it to Wagner's ring cycle? No, it's none of those. The answer, it turns out, is a lot simpler than that. And it starts in a hole in the ground, wherein there lived a hobbit. That's right. The answer goes back to Tolkien's book, The Hobbit, written long before The Lord of the Rings. In the original 1937 version, Bilbo finds Gollum's ring. It is not the one ring in 1937. And this ring confers invisibility upon him. Now, this alone isn't an unusual thing. Let's be honest. Magic rings have been part of myth and fairy stories for a very long time, several of which made their wearers invisible. The 12th century Arthurian romance, The Knight of the Lion, along with one of the tales in the Welsh, Mabinogion. I hope I got that right. And rings of invisibility even go back to classical antiquity with the Ring of Gyges. So, Tolkien including a ring of invisibility in his children's tale isn't a big thing. But why the rings of power and the one ring? Well, simply put, Tolkien needed a way to connect the Hobbit to the wider world of the mythology that he'd been building in order to write the sequel that Alan and Unwin wanted. In letter number 257, written in 1964 to Christopher Bretherton, we read quite a bit about this. First, Tolkien talks about his First Age mythology and how it was related to his developing Elvish languages. He says, The germ of my attempt to write legends of my own to fit my private languages was the tragic tale of the hapless Kulervo in the Finnish Kalevala. It remains a major matter in the legends of the First Age, which I hope to publish as the Silmarillion, though as the children of Hurin, it is entirely changed, except in the tragic ending. The second point was the writing out of my head of the fall of Gondolin, the story of Idril and Eärendil, during sick leave from the army in 1917, and by the original version of the tale of Luthien, Tenuviel, and Beren later in the same year. Okay, Tolkien, but where are the rings? Hold on. Later he says, by the time The Hobbit appeared, 1937, this matter of the Elder Days was in coherent form. The Hobbit was not intended to have anything to do with it. I had the habit, while my children were still young, of inventing and telling orally, sometimes of writing down, children's stories for their private amusement, according to the notions I then had, and many still have, of what these should be like in style and attitude. None of these have been published. The Hobbit was intended to be one of them. It had no necessary connection with the mythology, but naturally became attracted towards this dominant construction in my mind, causing the tale to become larger and more heroic as it proceeded. Even so, it could really stand quite apart, except for the references to the fall of Gondolin, the branches of the Elfkin, and the quarrel of King Thingol, Luthien's father, with the dwarves. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Tolkien later explains in that same letter, after the success of The Hobbit, he offered Alan and Unwin the legends of the Elder Days, but was turned down. They wanted a sequel. We talked about that last season. Now, right after that, Tolkien explains, and here's your answer as to why rings. The magic ring was the one obvious thing in The Hobbit that could be connected with my mythology. To be the burden of a large story, it had to be of supreme importance. I then linked it with the originally quite casual reference to the necromancer, whose function was hardly more than to provide a reason for Gandalf going away and leaving Bilbo and the dwarves to fend for themselves, which was necessary for the tale. In other words, the reason why Tolkien chose rings to be these artifacts of great power it's because he'd already written about a ring and had to find a way to connect the stories. Now, it's a bit of a prosaic answer, but it's the only one you're going to get. 
And of course, after realizing that he had to make Gollum's ring that Bilbo found into a powerful and evil artifact, Tolkien then retconned chapter five of The Hobbit significantly for the second edition, and that's the version you read today. But what happened to the seven dwarf rings, Joshua asks. Gandalf explains a bit about the other rings to Frodo in the shadow of the past, saying that seven the dwarf kings possessed, but three he has recovered, and the others the dragons have consumed. Well, from this, we can draw the conclusion that they were given to the kings of the seven houses of the dwarves. Seven dwarves, seven kings, each the king of their own house. Now, in Of the Rings of Power in the Third Age, which is in the Silmarillion, we read that after the war in Eregion, Sauron gathered into his hands all the remaining rings of power, that is, not the three, and he dealt them out to the other peoples of Middle-earth, hoping thus to bring under his sway all those that desired secret power beyond the measure of their kind. Seven rings he gave to the dwarves, but to men he gave nine, for men proved in this matter, as in others, the readiest to his will. Now, that thing about the seven rings being given to the dwarves doesn't square with what Durin's line believes themselves. In Appendix A on Durin's folk, we read that of Thror's ring, something may be said here. It was believed by the dwarves of Durin's folk to be the first of the seven that was forged, and they say that it was given to the king of Khazad-dûm, Durin III, by the elven smiths themselves, and not by Sauron, though doubtless his evil power was on it, since he had aided in the forging of all the seven. So which is it? Did Sauron take all seven and give them to the dwarves? Or did he only take six, with Thror's ring being given to Durin III by the elven smiths themselves, or maybe even Celebrimbor himself? Well, let's go to Unfinished Tales for that and the description of the sack of Eregion. Celebrimbor, desperate, himself withstood Sauron on the steps of the great door of the Myrdain, but he was grappled and taken captive, and the house was ransacked. There, Sauron took the nine rings and other lesser works of the Myrdain, but the seven and the three he could not find. Then Celebrimbor was put to torment, and Sauron learned from him where the seven were bestowed. This Celebrimbor revealed, because neither the seven nor the nine did he value, as he valued the three. The seven and the nine were made with Sauron's aid, whereas the three were made by Celebrimbor alone, with a different power and purpose. Well, it seems to me that the belief of the dwarves, at least those of Durin's line in this case, may be mistaken. Sauron took all the seven after torturing Celebrimbor. But what happened to the dwarf kings that were given these rings? Well, in Of the Rings of Power in the Third Age, we read, The dwarves indeed proved tough and hard to tame. They ill endure the domination of others, and the thoughts of their hearts are hard to fathom, nor can they be turned to shadows. They used their rings only for the getting of wealth, but wrath and an overmastering greed of gold were kindled in their hearts, of which evil enough after came to the prophet of Sauron. It is said that the foundation of each of the seven hordes of the dwarf kings of old was a golden ring. Then, in the appendix on Durin's folk, we read something similar. For the dwarves had proved untamable by this means. The only power over them that the rings wielded was to inflame their hearts with a greed of gold and precious things, so that if they lacked them, all other good things seemed profitless. They were filled with wrath and desire for vengeance on all who deprived them. But they were made from their beginning of a kind to resist most steadfastly any domination. Though they could be slain or broken, they could not be reduced to shadows enslaved to another will. And for the same reason, their lives were not affected by any ring to live either longer or shorter because of it. All the more did Sauron hate the possessors and desire to dispossess them. And there's your answer. They couldn't become wraiths by their very nature, nor could they be controlled. But greed could and was kindled, along with a desire for vengeance. And so that's a lot of what we see, instead of short, angry ring wraiths. And that wraps it up for Mailbag Monday. If you have a question you'd like me to answer, please email it to barlaman at theprancingponypodcast.com. Let them know it's for today's Tolkien Times, and I'll get to it as soon as possible, with priority going to patrons of the show, of course. Please visit patreon.com slash Tolkien Times to learn how you can support the show, get an ad-free feed, a monthly hangout with me, a bonus weekly episode, and a whole lot more. And finally, join me again tomorrow on today's Tolkien Times for Tolkien Tuesday as we learn more about the professor himself and the TCBS. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, please be sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. 
Please follow or subscribe in your podcast apps and follow at Tolkien Times on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Finally, as Fadermeer says, go with the goodwill of all good men. <laughs>